Welcome everyone to Coffee with a Codex. My name is Dot Porter and I am a curator in the Kislak Center for Special Collections, Rare Books and Manuscripts at the University of Pennsylvania Libraries. I split my time with the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies, which is our research and development institute focused on manuscripts. Uh, my work primarily has to do um, with digitization. I have a long career in digital humanities, um, but I'm particularly interested in the sort of philosophy of manuscript digitization, like what does it mean to digitize a manuscript and how you look at it. And so video has become a major part of that. Um, and so Copy with a Codex uh, is one of my favorite programs I do once a week for half an hour. I open up Zoom and we take a book or sometimes more off the shelf and just do a little show and tell. Um, today's manuscript is one of a type that we actually have a fair number of, and I have another couple next to me, and there's a whole bunch more on the shelves. And these are um, uh, astronomy manuscripts from the Middle East. So these are in Arabic and in Persian. They range from, I think, the 12th century all the way up to the 19th century, probably later. We have a lot of them. And they're really interesting and cool. And they present uh, some difficulties because I, to me, because I can't read them. <laughs> so this is um, going to be sort of fun. However, I do know a bit about the um, astronomy as a medieval topic because we also have a fair number of um, astronomical manuscripts that are in Latin and we've looked at them before. And so we're going to be looking at this one. So this is LJS 412 from the Schoenberg collection. It is from, um, it's been dated to, it's been dated to, it's Cairo, a, written in Cairo, right, in Egypt, AH 950, which is 1543. So we'd say it's 16th century. Uh, it's written on paper. Um, and it is four treatises on astrolabes and astronomy. Um, and as part of my preparation, and because I wanted to see if I could, I actually made an astrolabe. And I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you why. Uh, why I did this in a minute. But if you want to make an astrolabe, I actually put a link to the site where I downloaded the PDF, and it has instructions uh, for that. So if you want to make your own astrolabe too, uh, you can do that. And we'll, we'll, we'll pull the astrolabe out again in a, in a minute. But for now, let's, let's just look at this. So it has four treatises. Um, and they all look, this is sort of the basic look. So the script, it's written in Arabic. The script is called the Nasc script. And the Nasc script is sort of the most, I guess, popular, um, most uh, uh, popularly used book hand across the Islamic world, um, written, writing in Arabic in particular. And this script, it's Nasq, but in the record it says that it's, um, it is influenced by Nastalik. And I wanna, the reason that I have the other two manuscripts is I wanna talk a little bit about what that means. Um, because it's kind of interesting. So this is a Nasc script that is uh, or, or influenced by Nastalik. Nastalik is the, the, the script that is used in sort of Indo-Persia. And so it's usually used to write Persian. It developed a little bit later. So Nasc, I was reading about it, Nasc, came up very, very early in, in written Arabic. And it continued to be used, I think still today, it's still sort of the, the script that used, it's the basis of the font. If you print something in an Arabic font and you just say Arabic font, it's gonna be Nasc or based on Nasc. Nastalik is um, different. It is um, a little more round and uh, drawn out. So this is Nasc in, influenced by Nasc, Nastalik. And actually the headings in this book are 
a straightforward NOSC script. And so we'll look at that. And then I'm going to show you an example of Nostalik here. So this is the first, um, the first treatise is the longest one. It's most of, it's actually more than half of the manuscript. This is a very short manuscript. It's got, I think, um, 18, 18 leaves. So this is not a very long manuscript and more than half of these um, include this first treatise. And you can see when we, um, when we look at manuscripts, um, this looks very different from the Latin manuscripts that we, uh, not, yeah, thank you, Amy, Nask. Um, this looks quite different from the manuscripts we usually look at. Um, Arabic scribes had their own ways of writing that are very different from Latin, even beyond um, the, uh, the fact that they're writing in a completely different uh, language and a different script. But like Latin scribes, they wanted to help the readers um, figure out what, what is going on on the page just by looking at it. And so what we have here are rubricated sort of chapter or maybe not chapter because they're quite short, but little headings and then a section of text and then a heading and a section of text. And so when you look at the page, you see immediately how this, how this uh, text is organized like this. Um, and I don't know if you noticed on the first page, I didn't mention it, but in addition to the red, there's also a lot of green that shows up here. So maybe I can see it better if I, if I zoom in a little bit. You can see there's green and red and black. And so each of these colors are acting as cues to the reader. Um, and we'll see it used in different ways uh, through the text. So here we have, um, here, here's the middle of the, uh, of the manuscript. It's a single choir. So it is, um, so it's nine sheets that have been folded and sewn together. So we can see the thread here in the middle. And then this is where the section ends. And this is very nice. We have um, a, a layout that you see a lot in uh, manuscripts uh, from the Middle East, where the end of the text is indicated by this sort of triangulation, right? Like it, clo it, it closes out nicely. And this is also, um, this also contains a colophon. So I went, I tried to see if I could see uh, the author's name here. I couldn't, I, again, like I don't read Arabic, um, but the, the author actually signed it here, or the, I should say the, the scribe. So the scribe has signed it here. And so on the next page, this is where we have the start of the second treatise, which is quite short. The other, the other three treatises are quite short, but here's the header. And you can see that the letters in the, in the head are much more upright. They're very straight up and down. The, the ascenders here are, are quite up and down as opposed to the writing in the main text, which is a little more leaning. It's a little more um, sort of tipped to the, to the right. And this is the distinction I think that's being made between Nasc and the Nasc that is influenced by Nastalik. So there's a little bit of a lean happening here. Um, so I'm going to move this aside just for a minute, and I'm going to show you an example of a Nastalik script so you can see what the influence is um, there. How did this, so Karen has a question, how did the scribes achieve the right, left, justified lines? Did they use abbreviations? I'll come back to that question in just a second. Let me pull this out. So this is actually another um, uh, astronomical manuscript. This is LJS 434. And the, um, yes, the link is there. 434 is written in Persian. And um, it is also 16th century. Uh, so around the same time period, I wanted to be sure, it's a little bit earlier, but I wanted to be sure um, that it was sort of similar in time to this place. It's very different. So this was written in Iran, 
which was sort of the heart of the Persian Empire. Um, the other manuscript, 412, um, is from um, Cairo, Egypt. And this is this is what the Nastalik script looks like. It is a lot more curvy and um, it looks, and here we, here we are again, very different. And we can see, again, these headings are written in that Nasc straight up and down script. So I think I'm gonna pull this one out again another time because I really like this one a lot. I, I wanna do more with these, um, these Middle Eastern um, manuscripts, particularly the scientific ones and the astronomical ones because they're very interesting. So we'll come back here. Here we go, back to 412. And this is the end of the second treatise ends on this page. And it, it lacks the sort of triangulation that I know that's not the right word, the sort of triangle shape of the end. Um, but we know it's the end. I know it's the end because um, it, it ends and there are, um, there's room for more text, but they haven't written, the scribe hasn't written more text. And then if I turn the page, there's a new heading at the top. So we, we so this is the start of our next, um, of our next one. So I wanna go back to Karen's question about the scribes achieving the right left justified lines. I don't, I, I don't actually know enough about Arabic to know if they, um, I think that there are, um, they do use abbreviations. I think there are actually more abbreviations in the Nastalik. When people write using the Nastalik script, there are, it tends to have more abbreviations, which may be another reason why it says that it's, um, that the, the script is influenced by it. Um, I can tell you that rather than the ruling that, the kind of ruling that, that you see in Europe, um, which involves um, prick marks on, on the edges of pages and then using a either a pencil or um, a blind rule to line, to create lines, um, they would actually do ruling um, by the use of string. So you would have string on a, um, like on a wooden pallet and you would press the paper, usually paper, uh, against the string, and it leaves an imprint that I I can barely see it. I think that there is an imprint there, and so at least they have they have this guide for how much room to fill. And it may be that the scribe is just really good at eyeing how much room he has to um, to fill it in. I also I also don't know how um, whether the practice would be to continue a word onto the next line. You see that a lot in Latin, where if a if if the scribe runs out of room, they'll just start writing the you know finish the word on the next line, which also could be what's happening here. I don't know, but you're right to notice that this is very impressive. <laughs> it's very impressive. Uh, in terms of keeping keeping inside the inside the frame, so this is this was a very short one, just three pages. Again, we are ending um, with some lines to spare. There isn't a heading here, uh, which is sort of interesting. Um, although there is there is a note up here in the margin which might be a title. I'm not sure, but there. This is ending, but there's not a, a, a distinctive um, opening here. And then the last, this is the last treatise. So it hasn't been very interesting to look at really so far, but this is why the last um, treatise, the fourth treatise is on the use of the astrolabe. And this is why I made an astrolabe because it's got these diagrams in it, which are which are pretty neat, and I wanted to see um, if I could figure out um, what they what they were so sort of what was going on. So you can see here 
the way you probably, it's probably hard to see because this has a, um, this sort of clear plastic thing has stuff printed on it. So it's a little hard to, to tell what's going on. But what this is basically, as far as I understand, this represents the horizon. This dark line here is the horizon. And then you can calculate over time, that is over the course of the year and over the hours, you can calculate where the stars are in the sky and the zodiac. So you have the signs of the zodiac here, Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces, um, and these. And this, this is a guide to how you use it. So if I could read the Arabic, I could know what know exactly what is going on here. But this is the sort of inner part of the diagram. So here's the horizon. There's the horizon line. And then we have um, the various circles that are sort of tracking the stars across the sky. Um, and we can see here is another one. Um, that and this is this is good because we can then we can see that this is for the form like this so we've got the outer big circle and we've got the smaller circle on the inside and the lines are times so it's whatever time and date that is and then the idea is that that's what the sky looks like at that particular time. So I don't get a whole lot out of it, but it's sort of interesting to see that you could still take this and um, and sort of even use it. Actually, as I was doing, um, as I was trying to figure out how to make this work, I discovered that if you go to some other sites, there are several sites online that will tell you how to make your own astrolabe and how to use it. And a lot of them actually point to Chaucer who wrote a treatise on how to use an astrolabe in English, I think. So you could, I mean, middle English, um, but you could, you could actually follow his, you know, follow his instruction for that. Um, so this one I think is particularly interesting because it, I think what this is doing is this is the part of the astrolabe that has the um, the signs of the zodiac. So I'm pretty sure that this is um, this would be Sagittarius, Scorpio, Libra, Virgo, Leo, Cancer. They get small closer together down here. Cancer, Gemini, Taurus. Aries, Pisces, Aquarius, and then uh, Capricorn. So that is, that's pretty neat that even though I can't, I can't really read the words, I can still sort of see, um, see what's happening. So, so that is sort of the, con the content of it. There was something else interesting that came up that I thought was interesting as I was looking looking through this. And that is that in the catalog record, um, it says that part of two of the treatises are missing. So there's text missing. And let me find it. Uh, oh, that's I'm looking at the wrong record. It says uh, the first and fourth treatise are incomplete. The first treatise skips from chapter 22 to chapter 30 between folios five and six, um, which would be, it, it, they're not numbered, but we can find it. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. So there's, there's a, something missing here. And then the fourth is missing um, the some amount of the beginning, uh, which actually explains why there's no um, 
title. If you remember when we got there, the text ends. Let's see, there's that one. Here we go. So this ends and then it just sort of starts and there's no title. We can, we can sort of tell there was something going on because there's no title at the top. So I got interested because it seems like there's some missing from near the beginning and there's some missing near the end. And when that happens, I like to look at the sort of structure of the thing. So I'm going to, I'm gonna share my screen and I'm going to show you um, this is a, this is a, some of you who've been here before may have heard me talk about this. This is a project that I've been working on for um, a number of years and it's software that you can use to build a structural model of a manuscript. This is a very simple one, obviously, because it's only one choir. And it's also, it's also misleading because it, it should actually start down here because it's Arabic. It should be flipped the other way. Um, so it's, so it's turning the pages from um, uh, right to left, but I just wanted to see what was going on. And indeed, my first thought was, I think th that something's been pulled out of the middle or that something, it's not individual leaves, but it's like a portion. And so I made the little model. I noted here what the texts are. So you can see here's the first treatise um, that goes through uh, leaf 12 or folio 12. And then the next one starts and it's short. And then the next one starts and then we've got this at the end. And I discovered that between five and six, there's something missing, chapter 22 to chapter 30. Uh, the chapters are short, so probably um, maybe even just a page. And then I discovered that the it starts on 14 and so there's something missing between 13 and 14. And if you look, if you tra track the gap, you can see that these are conjoined or were conjoined, which I think that maybe it happened when this book was uh, rebound. So the I haven't talked about the cover yet. This cover is not a 16th century cover. This is at least 200 years after um, the book was written. And so maybe at the time that it was put into this cover, maybe after or before, probably not after, um, there was another bifolio that is another folded sheet that was in there and it somehow got taken out, whether it was, maybe there was something cool on it, maybe there was a neat diagram and somebody thought, I really want that, or it could have just been lost. Um, but now um, it's there. So, and you wouldn't necessarily, I only, thought of it because this is the kind of thing that I think about. Um, and so I wanted to share that with you that that there we're still there's still ways to like find neat um, new things about um, about the manuscripts in our collections. So I'm going to stop sharing. And since we have a thank you, Melissa, she says that's amazing. Well thought. Thank you. Yeah, I was pretty proud of myself when I um, when I thought of that. So since we have a little bit of time, I am, I'm gonna go back maybe and I'll, we can look at the other one too. And if you have any questions, feel free to um, put them in. But this other one, um, 434 is also very short. So it's, it'll be pretty easy to look at it um, here, but it is um, Persian 1507, um, from Iran, and this is much, you can see, this is, oh yes, Amy says, the one leaf, if one leaf was torn out, the other half of the bifolium would be more likely to fall out. So that's, that might be, um, actually that would, that would, that would explain it well. So it might've happened after it was bound. Uh, so Karen has a question about uh, 412. So I, I am gonna come back to 412. Um, she asks if the last diagram is unfinished. Um, let's see. So I don't know. I don't know enough to know because it looks compared to the other ones, it does look very plain. 
um, doesn't it? It has, you know, maybe maybe this is all it, that it needed. It could be incomplete, I don't know. Um, let's see, Fred is saying, um, I can read some of the letters at the top because it's written in Farsi and not Arabic. Um, in the top of it, in this manuscript, Fred, or, oh, you're not Fred, <laughs> sorry. Um, it's not Fred, is it? It's, it's a person who uses Fred's uh, thing. So I don't know. I'm gonna I'm gonna pull put this one back, and we can take a quick look through here in the next three minutes. Um, so we've got uh, a. Let's see, I have this open. This unlike the other one um, that just sort of said diagrams, um, this one is actually pretty well described. So this is the structure. And a, let me see, is that right? The structure and the arrangement of the seven climactic zones? That doesn't look like that. Let's see, but that's what it says. Um, and then I love how this is this is framed so nicely. It's very, very pretty. Um, let's see, geographic, oh no. The Eastern, I was reading it wrong. This is the Eastern half of a double page world map. So half of the half of the map is missing and it is a world map um, there. And here we have the structure and arrangement of the seven, the seven climactic zones of the of the world, I guess, going from I'm not, this is not how I'm used to seeing that, but that's that's very cool. This is the geographical relationship of various cities to Mecca. So in, um, in Islamic countries, and in fact, I, when I was reading about even using the, um, this is 1507 is what it says. Um, Hadi, um, yeah, 1507. I, I was reading about the use of the, um, the astrolabe in, um, Islamic countries and the astrolabe too can be used to find Mecca, which is obviously very important for um, for people who uh, follow Islam because you want to face Mecca when you pray. When you pray. Um, so let's see. Amy, can you put in a link to VC Editor? Thank you. Um, so finding in in manuscripts that are about um, astronomy in Islamic countries, it's not unusual to find things like, you know, how do you find Mecca? Because that was actually an important part of how um, the, the tools, the same tools that can help you find the things on the stars can help you find your way around on earth as well. Um, so here we have, uh, Rainbow predictions is what it's called. I'm not sure what that is. The setting and the rising of the moon. So you can see the, the stages of the moon. And I've seen um, very similar diagrams to this in uh, Latin manuscripts as well. There was a lot of sharing of, um, of knowledge back and forth. And then we have... Um, all kinds of things there. And then what is the last one? Half of a double page horoscope diagram. So a horoscope diagram there, and then you'd have the other half. So it's just a piece of what was probably a much larger one, but it's very pretty. And it is 1231. <laughs> so thank you for letting me talk at you about these, these great manuscripts. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring out more of them um, because we really have a great collection. So thanks very much. And uh, I hope I'll see you again uh, next week and the week after.